I'll call this meeting to order at 6 30. Uh, I would like to ask two Hampton Academy students, Will Doyle and Nathan Dang, if they would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And Jack Hanson. Uh, Jack. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have uh, two s retiring staff folk and would like to uh, acknowledge them. Um, Ginny, would you like to go first? The first one is Louise Bridal. Mrs. Louise Bridal began her employment in the Hampton School District supporting the food service program in 1995. She had worked in the cafeteria at Center School, Marston School, and Hampton Academy. For 20 years, she has provided breakfast, lunch to the children of Hampton, and for that, the district is extremely grateful. Louise has always had the needs of the children first and foremost in her work. And Louise couldn't be here tonight, uh, nor could this gentleman, Mr. Alfred Pierce. Mr. Alfred Pierce began his employment in the school district supporting the facilities department since 1987. He's worked at both Center and Marston schools as the day custodian. For 30 years, he's been instrumental in keeping our schools clean and safe for the children of Hampton. We're very grateful for his years of service to the district. Mr. Alfred Pierce, and we have a small token for both of them, but they're not here tonight. Alfred. Yeah. Okay. Good evening. I'm so Hampton Academy would uh, would like to share um, some of the things that we're doing as part of our student celebration. So I'm going to bring up uh, two gentlemen, two eighth graders, and Will Doyle and Nathan Dang. You guys want to do, be right there because that's where you're going to present from? Right here? Yep. And, um, and the gentleman on the screen is our special guest, and that's uh, Jack Hansen. Uh, Jack is uh, Jack's an eighth grade student. Jack's uh, um, still recovering from a bone marrow transplant. He's doing exceptionally well. We're very glad to hear that. But he's not able to be with us. So um, as part of language arts class, and I have uh, Ms. Maureen DeLuca, and, I think Jim Doherty is, is on his way. Um, Jim is a language arts, eighth grade language arts teacher, and Maureen is a special education teacher in the room. And they co-teach that class together. But um, we wanted to involve Jack in the curriculum as much as possible. So these two young men, um, who I want you to tell a little bit about yourself, what you do at Hampton Academy um, outside of that class. But um, they've taken it upon themselves to kind of help us with the technology, along with Mr. Lynn Paris and Angela Bowen, who's our guidance counselor. So all those people came together to kind of help Jack and make sure that eighth grade year for Jack is, um, is not just sitting at home, and, but he's, he's going to come back with us, but um, he's getting to experience what we do in the classroom in language arts. So Will, Nathan, it's all yours. Okay, so what we do outside of school is that me and um, Nathan, we both do our school local news station. Uh, it's called Shark News, and they have a YouTube channel. Um, daily posts on Friday. I'm not trying to do self advertisement here, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's very it's very fun to do. And basically, in Shark News, we just. Um, we basically uh, talk about like what we do, like what we're gonna do this week and what we're gonna do next week, and like stuff that is like after school and stuff like that. It's um so uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so I came into this position of helping Jack because uh, Miss Bowen came to me one day and said, "Is there a way that we could?" And, and uh, Jack's mom says, is there a way that we can get him involved with the classes and something we could do? And I said, yeah, we could find a way to have him FaceTime or Skype into the classroom and, and participate. 
Um, and these guys have stepped up to kind of be that daily tech support in the classroom who help make sure the connection works and uh, you know let the teacher know so that if there's something not working right to get in contact with our department to help to make sure that every morning Jack gets to participate in, in class with, with the, uh, the rest of his students. So Mr. Doherty has a class that he holds and uh, Jack participates every morning with them by Skyping in. When I tell him about the technology that you guys use, it, it, it actually Mr. Doherty was, is bringing it and he's running a little late. But you guys want to explain how you get Jack to be able to hear Mr. Doherty and then hear what the other boys and girls are saying and see what's going on in the class? Okay. So we use a device called the swivel. It is a mounted uh, swiveling device that has an infrared connection to a tracker. And the tracker is plugged into the back of the device. And uh, you can take that out and you can wave it in front of the infrared sensor and that moves with the tracker. There's a robot that we got as a, um, a gift to try it out. And uh, it, you rest an iPad in it. So the iPad is the camera connection. And, it, and as they said, this tracker uh, allows the robot to follow it. So wherever the teacher goes in the classroom, the robot hence swivels um, to follow that teacher. So if the teacher goes down, the robot swivels down. If the teacher's standing up, it swivels up and follows them around the classroom. And also it has this like neck piece where you can like put the mic on and you can like carry the mic with you without like holding it and you can talk to it, like talk onto it and Jack in here without like us like bringing the microphone close to our like mouths to make you hear us. We're so cutting edge on this fact that we're we're still working out some of the bugs as they've talked as a company of allowing this to happen live through their software. We do it through Skype, which results in a few bugs if we have to unplug when Jack wants to talk because the, the device only knows to do one or the other. So we plug it back in when Jack wants to hear, we unplug when we want to hear what Jack has to say. So so can he talk to us now? Yeah, because we're not doing it through the swivel and not doing it through an iPad with a single Jack, he can hear us. So Jack, we have a couple ways around that. Jack actually has, Jack, when you can't hear us, what do you do? Do you have your, uh, he can't see me. I, I hold up a... A, a whiteboard, yeah. We go, we go low tech with that, but it works very well. <laughs> is that as high as it goes? Okay, well, go ahead and ask a question. Okay, so. Um, we have like about two questions to like ask him. Nice and loud. I don't know if you can hear you. So, Jack, the first question is basically like. Um, I can, uh, well, we do have a paper, so. <laughs> like. Yeah. Want to grab it? Yeah. First question, from your perspective, do you feel that you are actually in the classroom? I don't think I'm in the classroom. Uh, as much as I want. Like, I feel like I'm in a tiny bit, and the rest is just like, oh, I have to a whiteboard, I have to uh, get someone's attention in order for them to uh, see. But other than that, it's, yeah, I feel like uh, in the bus. Okay, and then the second question, do you like that you are able to Skype into your language arts class? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it definitely is useful. I can, I can see that. So. <laughs> There's not really much I can say of yes or no. <laughs> uh, does the board have any questions for um, us or Jack? Jack, what would you like to see more of? Um, hard to say because.
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, you're attending some classes um, in person and other classes you are at home. Can you share a little bit about that with the board? So I can only uh, be around people if I'm outside because I can't be cramped up in a whole bunch of people in turn. So I can attend gym only if it's outside or I can attend classrooms when they're outside. But other than that, I can't really do much. Okay. Thank you. I guess that was my question. What other classes? Are there other classes that you can do through this same system? And I can do, like, any class that, does, that doesn't really... So I can do any of the four classes like uh, math, science, I can do social studies. I yeah, I could do a lot of them. It's just a matter of I don't know. I'm <laughs> I I just haven't been done doing much okay. of it. That's okay. Mr. Doherty's here and he'll explain it all. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I can kind of answer that. Um, we started off with language arts just to see how that went, and it's going very well. So our next class that we're going to integrate into Skype will be science, where Jack can participate in some science experiments that Mr. Tierney is doing in his classroom. That will be interesting for him. And then we'll move on um, to probably social studies. Math is a little harder. We're trying to, um, he's going to have a math tutor at this point, and um, Hopefully he'll be back in school full time in January. So we just we just wanted to integrate a little bit at a time. And what you you could be seeing is the eventual view of what snow days look like as we get into the history, the future of this with everybody having technology. There's that ability of now a snow day could still be a class day, right? Because, I mean, Jack, in essence, is at home on a snow day every day. And, you just yeah. made everybody tonight, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> can you follow, can the robot go maybe from class to class or not? Uh, yes, it can, because it is a portable device. It's literally like this big. Yeah, but oh, we would have to, like, oh, care. Got it. Oh, it. Here it is, voila. So we, we've actually had classes where uh, we started out in language arts and went to the library and the kids literally walk Jack down the hall you know, like this. So he's with them and they talk to him all the way down the hall. So it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been very mobile and it's very easy to take from class to class. And then these guys do an awesome job with setting, setting up. They set up for us every day and they set up in, in the classes that we've been mobile so far. So there are, there, there are big uh, mobile tech support. So who came up with this idea? Did you, Greg, or did you did Pretty fact? much, yeah. Um, I had seen the potential of this device a couple of years ago and asked if I could get one. And then when when Miss Bowen came to me saying, what can we do? I said, well, we have this device in the district and it, its real intention is to record a teacher teaching and then the, the children can go home and watch that recorded lesson as the idea of flipping the classroom, if you're familiar with that term. But I said, we could adapt it and find a way to use this so that Jack can participate live. Um, at the very same time as we were talking about this at the end of last year, the company Swivel said that they were had a, having a big announcement over the summer and they were going to integrate within the software the ability for this to happen. So we were already way up, ahead of or where the company was already thinking. And they announced two things at, at ISTE. And the second thing was so successful that they've put the support of the software and live integration on the back burner. And it hopefully will be coming soon. I've asked us to be a pilot of that to give them some feedback. But um, that in, within the software would eliminate the having to plug and unplug so that Jack could hear us. It would just be the conversation like we're having now. But um, that's not quite there yet because we are literally on the cutting edge with this. So. You indicated that on the robot, okay, that you have to disconnect, connect. For him to to talk, because you're plugging into the headphone jack. Mm -hmm. So with Bluetooth technology, it's recognizing that device as being a tracker outside of the software. So either I track or I use the, the um, 
get the microphone or I, I, I can hear you. So the software has been written to allow both those things to happen, but through Skype it doesn't understand that. So it's like, okay, you have headphones in, so you're going to hear me or you're going to talk to me, but uh, I can't track and do those things at the same time. So Skype wasn't taught to do that. So um, when their software fixes that problem, then we won't have to worry about Jack plugging and unplugging. It would be just as it is here. We're doing it through a computer, so we can have that two-way conversation, but through an iPad, setup's a little bit different, so that can't happen. Okay, thank you. Can I ask Jack yep. another question? Jack, are you taking online classes at VLAC? Yeah. What are you taking over there? Art and Spanish. Okay, art and Spanish. Great, yeah. great. Um, it, the VLAC, as you know, is, was originally started with high school, but now the, the programs are down into the middle school, and they're actually doing some elementary classes for youngsters for whatever reasons. I mean, the youngsters that attend VLAC, it's a variety of reasons. Jack accesses, but we have other children who access other students who access VLAC. It's a great resource. Is that how do you like it, by the way? It's good. Good. Great. Well, thank you guys for coming. And uh, thank you, Jim, and all of the folks that are making this work. Greg, right? thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, good job. Thank you. thank you, Jack. Bye, Jack. <laughs> Say hi to Mom. <laughs> okay. Uh, board member <coughs> updates. Frank, anything? Uh -huh. No, I tried. I know they have some Halloween stuff coming up, but I wasn't able to get through to the office. Okay. Andrea? Um, the superintendent fortunately covered the um, curriculum meetings that I was not able to attend, and we've got some more coming up. The science is still finishing up their performance assessments, uh, which is really phenomenal for us. Other districts are not doing that, and we are. And um, Social studies is just getting started. And do we have two meetings this month on social studies? We have a yeah. Um, we have a regular meeting date, and I have those dates for you. You know, I have them, but I saw two. Yeah, two and weeks then the in a row. Second I just one is with Heather Driscoll to start the process <laughs> okay. of the matrix. Right. I just wanted to make and sure I'm I was packing. right. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I was right. This two. That this is month. an all. That's a full day one because okay. it's so intense. That yep, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Bridal. We're in the middle of budget season. We're ready to start. <laughs> we um, had a rather interesting meeting last meeting, and I'm sure that the meeting will continue, so it's good. Uh, public comment on the agenda? Okay. Maybe we can start with the principal's report. Uh, Mr. Lannon, you want to start with the principal's report? That's okay. Good evening, everyone. If you've had a chance to look at my report, do you have any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you much. We're off and running. I, I can see that. Yeah. Um, not, not on your report, but on your website, all those pictures, there must have been a hundred pictures. I went through them because I was looking for my granddaughter. They were great pictures. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're very active uh, with uh, with the uh, Twitter and the uh, Facebook. It's, it seems that we're doing multiple ways to get a message out to parents. Yeah. They're trying to reach their comfort zone, so it really works. We get a lot of positive feedback. Appreciate it. I only have one thing. Um, after the success of the um, science camps this summer, I really hope, I, I know we're doing a great deal with Marston, and we got that great lot of money. Uh, obviously, Hampton Academy is you know, doing phenomenal. I really hope that we can continue down into the lower grades to bring STEM. Absolutely. And, and I hope we look at it when we go to do our budgeting to give you the resources that you need to just to um, bring that together and integrate it too. Absolutely. You know. We do a great deal. We've had some opportunities where we're doing it already, and integration is the key, Andrea. That's the thing where we have a lot of training, uh, most recently in the uh, STEM area, and we're doing a lot of activities in the classroom, okay. especially in the primary grades. Most everything is integrated, right? So everything, you cover multiple common core areas through multiple subject areas. So we're doing a nice job with that. And as you know, uh, we had a very successful science um, 
after school program, and then we're going to continue with that this year. We had 60 students in kindergarten last year. We focused on the kindergarten with our science camp because we want to catch them and get their interest right off the bat. And it's amazing how many kindergartners stayed after school, and because they're tired at the end of the day. But I just they, hope. I yeah. just hope when we do budget yep. that we'll recognize that if you need the resources, we're here sure. to help you. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I just want to put a plug in for the PTA that they need help with their Santa Claus breakfast. And if they don't get a committee, they're not going to do the Santa Claus breakfast. So even if you don't, aren't one of the 1,200 students' parents that we have, you can still volunteer with the Hampton PTA for their Santa Claus breakfast, which will be the weekend after the Christmas parade on Saturday. But they are looking for people in the planning stages. So they have a website. They have an email. Get a hold of them, please. Thank you. PTA does a fabulous job. They do. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Saturday. Lois? Good evening. Hi. Hi. So things are pretty quiet over at your neck of the woods, Lois? Other than our sidewalk that we're taking yeah. care of. Uh, they, tied, yeah. they finished it today by, at 5.30, so. And now I think they're going to go down Marsden Way. So I think it starts there, but it's going to go all the way down Marsden Way. Oh, good. I think that was what we what I thought we heard, the sidewalk project. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, they're coming right along. Did they raise up the manhole there? Yes. Uh, Did they? Yes. <sighs> They're working on them, and they had it all covered. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. It was National Custodians Day on October 3rd. I would like to give a shout-out to all the custodial Absolutely. staff yeah. who just go above and beyond to make our buildings amazing, awesome. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. We did recognize them with a coffee cake, and as we do for all of our, like our food service worker day is, is also, so we try to recognize right. those groups. Good time. Definitely. They work so hard. We've got a lot of things going on, which is awesome. Yep, we, we'll start so next week. We'll be It'll be a very busy after school at Marsden. We will have Mondays and Tuesday will be homework assistance and band for fifth graders. And then, of course, on Wednesday, we'll have Kid Fit Boot Camp. We'll have STEM Robotics. We'll have Art Club. So lots of great opportunities for boys and girls to get involved. It looks like we're um, on Wednesdays, we'll have about 125 students involved. And then with between the band and homework assistance will be another 80 students. So great, great opportunities for boys and girls to get involved beyond the school day. And then, of course, we'll have our um, Learn to Ski, Learn to Snowboard evening that will come up in November. And I'm assuming it again, it will be another good turnout, too. So try to provide those opportunities for boys and girls to extend their learning. There is a late bus for students attending those programs, correct? Um, on homework club and band, there is on Mondays and Tuesdays, um, but not on Wednesdays. Okay. Yeah. And if you fill up, will there be an opportunity for those that couldn't get on to be? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's always, um, we try to um, target specific grade levels um, for certain activities, depending on what they were doing. I know that we talked about that just because we wanted to limit it. And again, they, they're... They fill right up, but we will offer definitely a second, at least one more session of each. So, yeah, try to get as many involved as we can. Any other questions for Lois? Mm -hmm. And you're closed as well as the other two schools on October 28th for teacher and service. Correct, correct. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Dave? Anything you want to highlight? Oh boy, um, every every month is busy. Um, this month um, we uh, we have some service projects that are going on. Um, our student council um, is focusing on making strides for cancer, um, and they're doing. We're having a social uh, next Friday evening from seven to nine. We need some chaperones. If you'd like, if you're available, we'd love to have you. Um, our, our sixth grade is headed out to uh, Camp Mara Vista in Center, Center Tufton Borough on the 24th through the 28th. And, uh, um, you know, it's this October we just start to hit our stride. We've now been in school for six weeks, so schedules are set. Um, and, um, 
and uh, routines hopefully are set as well for our students. So uh, it's been a, it's been a good start of school uh, school year, and we're October. Before we knew it, it's October. Yeah. Yeah. How was the uh, sticks and stones? Assembly? It was wonderful. Um, uh, we had uh, two musicians uh, do an artisan residency. Uh, they were in school for a total of five days, and we decided to have them work with our eighth graders. Um, and uh, the eighth graders uh, um, met with the, uh, they did a 45-minute practice uh, rehearsal with uh, these two musicians, uh, uh, Skip, uh, uh, Skip Burnett, who is a Hampton resident, and Jeff Irwin, they, their company is called Trash Can Lid. But Sticks and Stones is, um, is a program they do for schools, particularly um, middle schools and elementary schools, that focus on um, anti-bullying, um, living a, a healthy, positive lifestyle. Um, I was a little nervous when we, we decided to, to use the eighth grade because eighth graders, um, you know, they're, they're kind of maybe too old for that, they think, or they're, they're not, they don't always want to put themselves out there, but um, they did. And uh, last Wednesday night, we put on uh, two performances, one during the day for the student body and the staff, and then on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock uh, for parents. Um, packed house for, for both shows, and uh, the eighth graders, um, they came through. They, they shined. Um, boys and girls who um, weren't necessarily uh, musicians or singers um, took the forefront, um, and uh, it was a, it's a very visually stimulating show that they do. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Hampton PTA, um, our enrichment account we have here, um, and uh, donations from the Hampton trustees to, to make that residency possible. We'd, uh, we'd love to try that again. It was, it was a wonderful experience. I just have a question. When, they, um, when the kids go to environmental camp, do they come back on the 28th? Yeah, they, they leave. The yeah, they leave. Uh, yeah, they leave Tufton Borough about noontime, and they get back a little after two thirty. Good. I didn't want them to lose a day at camp. No, it's right. a great week. It's a great day, and, and when they come back. <clears throat> Good. Awesome. Although in the past, as as now, um, for staff that go to environmental school, this has been a little bit of a problem because, of course, they're missing the in-service day because they're with the students at environmental school. So again, I guess in the future, maybe I'd, I'd hope that we could look at Yeah, we're going to work on the calendar for next the year. The calendar yeah. so that we don't have that conflict, That's if nice. possible. Absolutely. Any other questions for Dave? Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Folks like to go home. They have the principals. Just yeah, just, I'm, just. I, I'm coming to you. Oh. Okay, but then afterwards, feel free. Yeah. So, Jessica. We've been off to a busy start. We had eight um, students move in with IEPs already in place, so our case managers are kind of off and running getting that set up. Um, in addition to that, um, the Pupil Services Department has been working really hard on the, the grants. As you see in the report, the IDEA grant slash preschool grant was approved. Um, our Title I grant was approved and the UDL grant was approved. Um, in addition to that, we're in the process of working with our cohort for the Title III grant, which is the ESOL grant. And so we're working with our counterparts in Seabrook, Timberland, and Wyndham to develop a budget, which we then submit um, for approval um, for the DOE. So we're just working, I'm working with the cohort right now to get, get all that in. Is the Title III grant a two-year grant? So interestingly enough, it's actually, there's actually three grants going on at one time. Um, so we just closed out our 1415 grant. Our 1516 grant is um, 18 months, so it's still going. It doesn't end until September of next year. And then we're starting our 1617 um, grant currently. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Any other I, no, questions? I noticed that enrollment in Marston increased by seven students. Seven new students moved in with IEPs. Mm -hmm. And so we have meetings around that and decide whether or not that IEP, um, depending if it's out of state or in state, would carry over and, and um, accept, we would accept it. Okay. You want to say a little bit about what's going on with preschool kids too, Jess? 
Yeah, absolutely. So enrollment um, this year started pretty high for preschool. And so with that being said, um, we look at the IEP to help kind of determine how many days of, of the week they'll be attending, whether it's going to be a three-day program, a two-day program, or if they need a, a four-day program. And really, it's the intensity of their need um, determines that programming. And so we do we do have a lot of intense needs in the in the preschool program right now. So um, due to that, some of the other students that don't have as intensive needs aren't getting as many days of the week, just based on what their plan is. In the past, we've been able to give them an additional day here or there because there's been some space. And now that there, there isn't as much space, um, we're limited as to how how much? How many? Um, we can continue to take in students. We'll have to add staffing, but at the amount of time that they can spend in the preschool really depends on what um, the, the intensity of the needs of the students in the program. They're already right now at what they were last June. Yeah. Mm. So. Wow. So. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to watch it. Exactly. Yeah. And support it financially. If right. We can. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very important program. Yes, it is. Wow. Any other questions? No, I'd just like to commend you as a, a newbie. Um, you've done a really fabulous job getting everything up and running and smooth and the ball rolling well. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Greg, did you <coughs> speak to technology? No, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, particularly, I just didn't want you to feel left out. That's right. I, um, one update: uh, fiber for the district should be in by the 26th of this month. So uh, I've pushed the company to try and get it sooner than later, due to the fact that we found uh, an additional cost would incur if we had to keep our sonic walls up and running for an extra month till it happens. So um, I just heard back from the company today that they're hoping that fiber will be from the telephone pole to our buildings by the 26th, and that will save us $8,000 in the district, which is a good thing. So. That's huge for us. Yeah. That yeah. is huge for us. Yeah. Any questions for Greg? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So moving right along, um, smarter balanced assessment results. Okay. So Greg, you had those up. And the principals are going to stay in case you have any questions specific to their to their work. Today. Okay. So we're we're I, up on the up on the screen is the results of the last two. We just like wait. To, can you going to make that a little bit? That's yeah, it. Yeah, Thank it you. Yeah. And you also have this in your packet. Um, but they're the last two years of the Smarter Balance. You know that that's the state assessment that the New Hampshire Department of Ed has uh, is is part of a, a large cohort of about 30 states across the country. Um, they take this. Some states take Smarter Balance. Some take uh, another one called Park. Massachusetts takes the Park. Some are doing and asking for waiver, waivers from the federal government to take uh, their own tests. But right now, New Hampshire is sticking with Smarter Balanced in grades three through eight. And in high school, um, we're maybe one of five states across the country that uh, they're taking SATs as the state assessment. All students are taking the SATs as juniors. Uh, and they're using those scores to measure student uh, performance. So um, we, we, we are doing things a little bit different in New Hampshire. Um, I, I wanted to show you how the kids are doing in terms of year to year. So the arrow that you see represents the grade to the following year. So let's start out with third grade. If you look at 13, 14, 78 percent of the kids were proficient or proficient with distinction. So that means they either scored at a three or a four. So, um, and then this past year, 77. So it, it remained pretty steady. Um, uh, I think that uh, t the, Tim would say to you, and he will, um, that you know, there's all we're working on it. There's room for improvement. I think that the principals will also tell you that our greatest challenge is the transition of kids. I, I, you heard Lois got seven youngsters that you know. They haven't been in Hampton. 
they've been all over the place. You know, they're just not from New Hampshire. They're from other states, and so they they um, challenge us. But I'm very confident, um, and as you can see, if you look at the results, you'll see how hard those teachers are working in English language arts. So take take a look at fourth grade last year. Um, there were the the youngsters were at 64 percent of them were proficient. Uh, and they moved up to 78%. Um, so they had a significant jump. You can see that's quite a, a jump from year to year. Again, the teachers took the data from the test. They drilled down. They were able to identify the kinds of questions the youngster, youngsters missed, things that they, they thought they would score better. Um, they also took a look at the subgroups. So they looked at special ed. They looked at um, the English language learners. And as you know, that population has been growing. And then the other group is our um, social economic group, uh, which um, is, it stays about steady. It stays somewhere around the 20% range. But, but with that said, uh, fourth to uh, this year, the fifth grade, the students jumped 14%. More kids were proficient or proficient with distinction. In grade five, the same thing happened. In, in grade five, in 14, 15, they scored at 73. And and this uh, last spring, they, uh, as sixth graders, scored at the 81st. So 81% of the kids were uh, proficient or proficient with distinction. And the, the part that, it, that I like about this so much is that it shows how the kids are improving. You know, they're building on the skills that they learn. And, and, you know, we work very hard to get reading as a on grade level by third grade. So they keep building on it. And you can see that we build and build and build. So every year we've seen, a, a, in, in English language arts, we've seen a um, significant increase in the student scores. The, the last column is the state scores for this current year. So. You know, I've always been a little reticent about talking about state scores because, you know, you're talking about all school districts. You're talking about the big city schools. You're talking about some of the very rural schools. Um, and so I, I, I use that score only as to give you an idea of a point of reference. So, for instance, in uh, grade three, our youngsters scored 71 more proficient or proficient with distinction and across the state 56 percent of the kids were proficient or proficient with distinction so you draw your own conclusions but just remember that this is much more of a diverse population than perhaps is here in Hampton although I say that we are changing our demographics are changing significantly any questions on that English language arts uh, uh, Dave, um, Lois, you, you want to share anything with that relative to the English language arts? Any comments, anything that you might be doing at your school that's helping to the students? Well, remember we've, we've done the could curriculum you, Dave, renewal. Could you, Dave, could you go process. to the... I'm sorry. We, we look at each curriculum area, we focus on the, on the cycle that we have, and quite, quite honestly, we started with language arts. Um, that was the very first one we did. And and I think we have to go back eight or nine years that we came, we, we came up with the goal that it, by third grade, students would be reading on grade level. So this is, a, I, I think it's only one test, but it is a, an indicator that what we did or what we're doing is working, um, particularly in language arts. Um, um, and uh, honestly, uh, you know, we again. It's it's a test in May, so it's cumulative. At the end of the year, it's, it's we always worried whether there was a tough time to give it. It's, the weather's just starting to get nice, but it really is a um, a val a, it makes a valid you know val valid point of of I like testing at the end of the year rather than the beginning of the year. We when we did the uh, kneecaps, we would often do them in October. We're just getting like we are now, just getting into our rhythm. So. This is um, this is the hard work by by teachers and students um, paying off at the end of the year. I agree with you, um, Dave. It's it's one it's one data point, but it's um, a data point that we obviously 
um, look at closely because it does help to consider trends in terms of our student populations and in terms of how we're delivering the curriculum. So there, there are three areas that we're focusing on or three things that we're doing differently maybe this year. And one is we are working with the New Hampshire Data Consortium where we're specifically um, targeting ELA. Um, the New Hampshire Data Consortium is a group that came out of the Department of Education. It was Mike Schwartz, Karen Matzos, and Ian Mordecai, who used to be um, supported by the DOE, and now it's no longer supported, so they're now on their own. And so we are actually part of that consortium that allows us a number of things. One, it allows us to attend professional development days. It allows us to participate in their webinars. And it also allows us to do some goal setting with them with our achievement team. Our achievement team is specifically um, focusing on language arts and actually conducting a language arts assessment audit. What we're doing is really looking at our assessments and determining are we getting the data we want. And then, of course, um, how can we use that data to drive um, decision making? We began this work just last Friday. It was a great morning. Um, and from it, Ian, um, Karen Matzos was able to put together for us this beautiful grid that kind of shows us um, what our assessments are and really looking at these universal screenings that we do for all children, which in, would include the STAR assessment, the Smarter Balance, and the Common Assessments. And then it looks at some of these other things that we do uh, for children that might need a second shot, like our Tier 2 and Tier 3 students. And what we're looking at is um, it's been interesting because we're noticing some duplicity, which is kind of a nice thing because it's, it's showing us what we might do differently. So that's the first thing. So working with the data consortium. The second thing is we continue working with Cynthia Merrill um, on specifically balanced literacy. And last year we focused on grade three with grade four and five getting some of it. This year we're focusing on grade four. Um, and with four and five getting, or three and five getting a little piece of it, so we're in year two of that. So that professional development um, continues um, in the school, in you know, along language arts. And then the final thing is, is that we are kind of we're learning to really drill down and look at what what do the numbers mean. Um, again, it's good for trends, but we really want to look at kids um, considering three data points. So the great thing is, is that. Um, Trish Toffee, along with Liz Cronin and Trish Crowley, that's our target assist teachers and the reading specialists, are really looking at data to determine, you know, where, where are the students? And then are the numbers, do the numbers um, surprising? I think one of the things that we learn is when you look at the data, you have to ask yourself, is this what we expected? And when it's not what we expect, the question becomes, well, why and what do you do differently? And I think that coaching from that data consortium is really helping us to really look more critically at it um, and, and trying to figure out if the results aren't what we expected, then what is it that we might do differently or how can we um, relook at the data to perhaps improve in how we deliver instruction or how we can support students. So I think we've got some good things in place. It's going to take a little bit of time, but I, I, I feel like we're on a great path. Thank you. Just a couple of things from the primary level. Um, it's just important to understand that uh, we don't give the test at, at, at center school, obviously. It's an end of third grade exam, but the job at center school is tremendous because we provide those foundational supports. And our job isn't to teach to any test, uh, not that they're teaching to any test, but our job is to prepare the students. And how we're doing that is we have continue to have for five years now a strong understanding. We had a grassroots effort of digging deep into the Common Core State standards and, uh, standards and we're teaching planning, assessing, and now reporting out on the standards. So having a firm understanding of the Common Core standards, having a research-based program in English language arts for reading and writing with our writer's workshop, strengthening our math program each day, each year by taking a strong look at our created formative assessments that we've been working with, demonstrated uh, successes, Karen Matt. So we've been working with her for three years now. So we have those creations and those things. So we'll continue to take a look at it. And the best thing that we're doing is uh, through the demonstrated success, we have an opportunity uh, several times throughout the year to work with grade three teachers. So our grade one and grade two teachers will be doing some data dives with grade three. So as we prepare for the Smarter Balance test. So again, strong foundational supports, providing quality professional development. Um, and continuing to meet the needs of all the students is what we're doing at the lower level.
I just want to point something out to that when I was looking at this data just now. I asked myself, how is one-to-one -one impacting this? And I said, what was the first grades that we started with one-to-one? -one? It was grades three and grade six. And when you ask which of the grades that have some of the largest differences to the state, it's grade three and four and six and seven. And we've been doing this for two years. So the third grade is now fourth grade is it? Sixth grade is now seventh grade is It'd be interesting to see. I, I'm not saying there's a correlation here yet, but as we look at that data. Well, you're going to have to prove that in yeah, the morning. Well, <laughs> it'd be nice to see. Well, that. Good point, okay. Greg. Very good. <laughs> so I, I'm an optimist at heart, right? So now I want to talk to you about math. Yeah. And um, unless you have questions on language yeah. arts, and then well, maybe. I, I've got a question. Okay, go ahead. I'm no, sorry. but I'll wait for after your math okay. thing because it'll probably relate to that as yeah. well. So, Greg, have you got math up there? So same, you know, the, the, the way it's designed is all the same, so I don't have to repeat that. But um, th they, ha they show a little bit of progress, at, but very little. Not the kind of uh, jumps that we experienced in language arts. And so I won't tell you that we were disappointed at um, at the results this year in math, but I will say this, um, they have worked very hard to identify areas where they feel that we have, we need to rethink the, what we're doing. Um, we feel pretty strongly that they're doing okay with the operations. That's all the facts, you know, uh, the, the basic facts. That, that's not the issue here at, this, at, at Hampton, Hampton Academy at Center or at Marston. Um, it really, they've identified it as the higher level skills. And, and I'll get into that in a minute, and I think they'll share some of that too. But you can see that from grade three to four, they, they lost four points. Grade four to five, they did a little bit better. Five to six, they picked up a few points. Six to seven, they picked up one point. And in seven to eight, they stayed dead even. And so when you look at the language odds scores that are all up in the 70s and 80s, you, you, got, you have to say to yourself, what, what happened? And um, why didn't we make, since we have accustomed ourselves, as Tim talked about, the Common Core, right? We, we know what those competencies are. We know what the standards are. Why aren't we making the progress that we would like to see? And I think that um, I'm going to let Dave and Lois talk about it because they've identified it there and they've made some significant changes. So I don't know who wants to jump in. Dave, why don't you start? Because I think yours, and I, I will say that Anna, is the assistant principal, has a math background. So she's been instrumental in helping the math team uh, kind of analyze this. So Dave, you want to jump in? Yeah, we got, we got these results. Um, the math people actually called me and said we need to get together. So we sat down this summer. Um, and again, when you look at data, it's you don't want to make assumptions. You want to you want to you want to take the numbers for what they are. Well, we were we were very disappointed uh, in those scores um, because I think we worked very hard at math. One of the, the difference between language arts and math is that the resources are so very different. Um, most of the time, we're using a um, a math book or or a program, and we've um, we've used a program called Glencoe for a number of years. When, when Common Core came out, Glencoe was no longer a, a, a resource we could use. We used it as a supplement. And teachers began to collect materials to address the standards. And um, again, the, the difficulty is that you have levels of understanding. Level one understanding is a basic understanding of something. Level two is a little bit better. You're able to, to understand what the application is. Level three and level four are the higher order thinking skills, and that's where we want our children in levels three and four. Um, the materials out there um, that we that we were using weren't getting our kids to the three and four. Um, so we focus this year. We will focus this year on looking at um, resources and common asse common assessments that we can use across the grade levels, so that we can really collect some data and say where are we strong and where are we we weak in. Um, the kids can do the computation. Where they were having the challenge is those open response questions. Where in language arts, a, a child will write a page and a half on a story. But in math, because you're using math vocabulary and, you're, and you have to explain things in a certain way, it's a very technical type of writing. 
um, it was, they found it more difficult. And I think that's, that's where our kids uh, fell back on in that in math you think there's one answer. And you're absolutely right, there's an answer. But the important part is how you get to that answer. You just can't give the answer. And our kids can definitely give the answer. Where, they're, where they need to improve on is actually being able to elaborate, explain it, and how that application is, it can be you know, used acro across an area. Um, so we've, sit down, we've sat down and we're gonna have these common assessments developed um, by the mid-quarter. And, um, and we're going to take a look at, at, at that and, and do practice problems of the week. So the kids, not to teach to the test, but obviously there is a certain, there's a certain expectation they have in that test um, for you to score in a, high, um, a very high category. So we have to, um, we have to, to change that. Um, we are gonna look at piloting some materials. Marston has a brand new math program. Um, we're gonna get those materials so that we can see um, what those resources are because we want our kids using the same vocabulary as the primary and the elementary students. So um, we maybe come back, but again, the days of purchasing textbooks is, is over and done with. Um, a textbook is a, is a tool like anything. And quite honestly, um, most of the textbooks are digital now anyways. So we'd look, at those, we'd look at those digital resources, we'd look at those things that we can supplement and use across the grade levels to, to strengthen our kids' knowledge. Because I think they have a good base knowledge, but they're not scoring in the three and four categories as we hoped. Is this the second or third year that we've been concentrating, second year, concentrating on the math, right? Well, actually, with math was the very first thing we did back in 2011 so 12. And so, do we, we need to? Well, that's what we're doing. We're circling back. Right. You're exactly okay. right. All right. We have and to. And that makes sense. Yeah. Most of, the ma most of the math books you, you get, most of the questions are level one and level two okay. understanding. The, the we, kids we, are doing, they'll do great in the math book, but the math book doesn't take them far enough. We so, struggled with resources because everybody said they were all aligned to the Common Core, and they weren't. They weren't. And so we waited and waited to find the resources, and the, and the teachers were working towards that. But we, um, we've done some uh, review of um, resources now and find that they're much better. So I think Lois will uh, sort of allude to yeah. that a little bit. Right. Um, so we, we've been concerned about math, I think, like you probably now for a couple of years. And um, as, as you said, you just have to look what's out there. There is nothing aligned. But what we do have is teachers who are very capable, who have a great understanding of the Common Core and of our Hampton School District cur curriculum to make good decisions. So after we looked at several programs last year, although we found no perfect program, we did um, agree that Math and Focus was going to best meet our needs. Um, what it provides for us is a scope and sequence, common language, and common assessments. There's also um, a technology component that allows for interactive lessons, and it allows um, an online component. It also assists with differentiated instruction, where they have the reteach and the enrichment, and some also some really great inquiry tasks. Um, as you said, David, they, they do. They struggle um, with specifically um, communicating mathematical reasoning. As we looked um, into our math SBACs for the last two years, and you're really able to um, get a sense of where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are across the board, it really is the mathematical reasoning. Um, they can do the computation, but when you ask them really to explain it, they don't seem to have, or they're not able to communicate their understanding. So, so what? So what are we gonna? What are we gonna do about that? Well, obviously, we're focusing on those performance tasks. That's that's hugely important to us. Um, we also have our target assist teacher, who's looking more closely at how we can provide that experience for not just some students, but all students. Um, Nathan and I are doing a principals challenge every week, where there's. Um, we do one week it's third grade, one week it's fourth grade, one week it's fifth grade, um, and then the last week of the month it will just be one that anyone can take. And just as another way of getting um, kids to think about math and to know that we're thinking about math and we are in the lunchroom every day. So it's an opportunity for us to even start talking and using some of that mathematical vocabulary with students. So trying to hit it from, from all those ends. Um, but I think you know, 
the, the important thing, we'll be using this as a tool to see um, if we can make an impact, and, and I'm hopeful that we will. Um, along with the program comes some great professional development. In fact, that day that on October 28th will be specifically geared to professional development to, for teachers to look at the program and to talk about some of the questions that they have. Um, maybe one of the benefits of having used it now for six, seven weeks is they now know the questions they need to ask. So it's given us some time to prepare, prepare for that workshop day on October 28th. So um, we'll keep you posted. Now, all your teachers in third, fourth, and fifth grade teach math, right? Correct. And they're all excited, well, not really, I would, are they excited or embracing the changes in mathematics? I mean, that's a, well, they're also trying to keep up with seven other changes. Right. right. Oh, you, you know, that's, that's just a great, that's a great question. Um, there's, there's no doubt. Um, there's always a lot on our plate. There's no doubt about it. But one of the things that I, we did hear from them is that they wanted a tool, a consistent tool, um, that would help them with uh, mathematics. So that's why um, we went towards a program. Um, not that it was going to be the be all end all, but that again, it was a tool that would help with delivering our curriculum. And they could make those informed decisions around what lessons are we going to use and what lessons do we need to supplement and what lessons might we scrap, you know? So um, they're going in very informed, but you're absolutely right. Because that was the same problem with our science scores, is they could do, they could figure out what they had to do, but when they had to write down the answers, they had issues. Right. Yeah, and and it's interesting. I know at some point we'll talk about science, but you're absolutely right. The writing across the curriculum is huge. Um, we know that, so it's something that we're paying attention to. I think the other piece of it is the steam block, and that you know, Andrea, you alluded to that um, recently, just prior our prior conversations. We are now in, um, are, are able to, because of our class sizes, we have, some, we have an open block where we are going to be doing an integrated STEAM lesson for our students. We're starting with fifth grade, and they will actually be working, it'll be a co-teaching model where Amber Levine will be working with classroom teachers, as will Allison Griffin, as will Jay, Jenny Houston. And we've um, actually purchased some really exciting kits that I think are going to, from the Museum of Science, that I think is really going to get kids excited about this. The other piece is, is that Laurie Sullivan is teaming up with um, Liz Cronin and doing some health lessons with math. So when we start to talk about, you know, rates and pulses and how many, you know, reps can you do, we're actually getting the math involved. So there'll be some real nice um, connected lessons where It'll be a time for teachers to go in and do some co-teaching, and the learning doesn't stop when the period is over. The beauty is, is that they go back into the class, and the teacher has had the benefit of being in that class to see what's going on so they can carry it back into the classroom and continue the learning and make it more connected. So we're excited about it. It's kind of our, our pilot. We're trying it this year, but it did start this week, and they're very excited about it. So stay tuned, and we'll more information as it unfolds. So are you suggesting that uh, class sizes may have an impact on the score? Uh, not necessarily. I think, you know, our class sizes are, you know, they're 20. I think that's, I haven't heard that that's been an impact. Um, so. I think what she referred to, Frank, was is that the, because of the one less class, it allows the unified arts teachers like Amber Levine to participate yes. in a STEAM instructed uh, collaboration with the classroom teachers because, because they, they don't the we don't have as many classes. Yeah, they have the time in their State. schedule. Thanks, yeah. thanks, right. Yeah, they they have the time in their right. schedule. Right. Where not we not the size. Of yeah, the it wasn't. It was really the they have the uh, flexibility in their schedule to do this, and we thought. Let's do this. Let's try this. Let's see how it works, and let's get kids really excited about learning. And and I think they're going to be. So stay tuned. We know based on the signups for STEM, right? Yep. In this uh, invention camp, right. they love it. So it's just giving them another opportunity for it, um, and then hopefully teachers can carry back that back into the classroom. The, the right. hard part is that it takes patience, and it takes a lot of practice. 
and we all want these to go, oh, skyrocket by the next, and it might not happen, and we just have to be patient, and we have to give kids time to practice. It just takes, takes time. Yeah. And what was the time frame for this? Because uh, you, I think, space out your tests, correct? Um, the way we administer the Smarter Balance, we do it in the month of April. So you're right. We do it over the course of um, four weeks, and you're and right. Smarter Balance first? Before, Before SBAC? Yeah. Yes, it is. We do the Smarter Balance in April, and we do fourth grade does the um, kneecaps, like the 19th or the 20th, about the third week of May. So we do. So there's about a three, you know, there's about three weeks plus April vacation right. that they have in between. So but yeah. they're spaced out. The yeah, smarter they, balances yeah. are spaced yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. And we and we try to start with fourth grade, knowing they're going to get hit with the kneecaps in May. And they also are going to get a hit in April, February this year. So okay. our fourth graders are. Yeah. All right. How does that compare with Hampton Academy then? Well, our because windows, I think our windows a little bit later than the elementary school. Right. So we, we start at the end of April, and we we go right through about mid-May, uh, about, about four weeks. About four weeks, we do an ELA, language arts first, and then math second. Um, I don't know if there's any, you know, obviously the kids worked very hard. They did very well in ELA. You know, it's um, we have the same the same issue with eighth grade. Eighth grade then has to take the science kneecaps um, later on in May, but. Um, I don't. I don't. I think it's. It is what it is. You know, we we try to do everything right in the morning. That's what everybody's the freshest, um, and try not to elongate the test too much, but also not try to to do too many sessions. It's a fine line uh, to keep them motivated, keep them focused on on the assessment, because when you're doing it for three or four days in a row, they they they, they can. They get frustrated. They can um, and shut down. Have a challenge. When you say three or four exactly days. Yeah. When you say three or four days in a row. What are you talking about time during that day? Um, We're not talking about seven-hour days no, no, here. No, I okay. said so we do it in the morning. We, we typically try to try to do it for the, the testing window is, is about um, 90 minutes long. Now, kids don't need all 90 minutes, but we, we allow for that much time. It's about an hour, but you're right. They can have up to an hour and a half to up two hours. An hour and a half. Yeah. yeah. So you do. You have to kind of, like, 9 to 11, you kind of, that's kind of the window. So, Dave, all your math teachers just teach math, correct? Right. Are all of them embracing all these new new things that are happening, or all of them well, I, I excited? Think, I think as a group, they, they took this personally. Um, they, they saw those scores, and they said, that's not what our kids know and know, know how to do. Um, and so went right back to the drawing board and said, what can we do differently, or what do we need to do to get our kids competitive? We, we saw the ELA scores, uh, and... And again, there's still room for improvement there, but the the, the difference in the two really was a um, was a challenge to our, our math team. Okay, so they sort of embraced the challenge and are ready well, to. Uh, they yeah. took it personally. Yeah, yeah they did. Right, let me ask you another question, Dave. Is LA given first and then math, or math first? Last and then year we LA? did. Yes, we gave we gave ELA first. Yeah. ELA first. So there is a possibility that students can burn out when they enter into the math. Possibly. And then if, okay. Right. Is, and the other there, question I've got. Is there I've a got, way to petition to maybe get it the other way around or not? You, you can do either one. You can do either one first. Would there be know. any benefit to having the math before the LA? I think we'll discuss that as a team. Okay. Yeah. And the other question I have, I see Hampton scores, but do we have access to say SAU 21? Not yet. These are preliminary scores. Um, will these, we have access? We will have access once the state has um, scrubbed all of their data because it's pr still preliminary. They're still, like when they looked at the scores, they made sure that all of the scores reported were actually Hampton students. There weren't any mix-ups. Mm -hmm. We got the scores of kids who were here and the kids who left us their scores went somewhere else. So the state has to do all that scrubbing, make sure the scores are valid, and then they'll release them publicly. Uh, but I haven't got them yet. Okay, so maybe what we should do then, and this is just a suggestion, is to come back to this information once we have other schools and make a comparison of our SAU 
as compared to others because we may be seeing some growth well, I, I, some areas. one of the reasons I put the state score there is just to give you a point of reference. Even though we were disappointed in our math scores, we were still able to do better, uh, better than the state scores. Right. But, but I always am careful about comparing us to other districts. When I did that with science, as you recall, we were, I was reporting out scores of districts that you said were comparable to Hampton, and yet Hampton has 20 to 22 percent free and reduced, and they had three. You know, there is a difference when you have a population that is um, um, that that uh, hasn't been with you. Tim did a great study a couple years ago. He followed the kids that have been with him all three years, K, one, and two, and into third grade, and then looked at the test. He pulled out all the kids who hadn't been with us and only looked at the kids that had been with us three or four years, exposed to the curriculum, and the co and compared. So I just want to caution you that when we do comparisons to other districts, we don't have the same demographics. Oh, well, I understand and that, I just, but it, I, is, it does give you a sure benchmark. Sure it does, and I'll, I'll do that for you. I'll do that. We did it in science. We got some great data in science. And it showed how well they did, as disappointed as they were in science, they did pretty well. Okay. Any other questions on Smart and Balanced? Okay. Uh, one more point. This is only one point of measurement. You know, they use the star assessment. They use in the little, the young ones use dibbles, and they they have a variety of assessments where the teachers use to to measure their student progress. So, um, you know, we, we, we need to think about that a little bit, too. It's one point in time. Thank you. Enrollment? It's in. Uh, we have, you can take a look at it. It's interesting, but we're, if you compared to last uh, June, June 1st to October, we're down 18 students. We have 18 less students, um, but uh, <laughs> I know that. What one 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 one, and we're up to one one two three. Right, but I, I was comparing it to six one. Oh 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 okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah no. If you look at that, we're up. You know we're up. Yeah. Um, what 12, 12 kids, but still in comparison to what we left in June. That's what I was. Um, I think we're okay right now in the in the in the kindergartens and in, in the in the grades that you know you we talked about. Um, keep any an eye on it. We keep an eye on it. Any questions on enrollment? No. CIP, Mr. Lenny. So I, I, dropped, it on, I, I dropped it on you tonight, and I am so sorry that it missed the packet. The CIP has really not changed other than to be cleaned up. So the roof, um, the roof that were there, the parking lot that was there, etc. Remember that the town, the town according to its master plan and according to statute, in order to support an ordinance for impact fees, which are fees that are charged against development of new homes and properties, collecting dollars to benefit schools, libraries, other public functions, municipal services, you must have a capital improvement plan as a part of that master plan. So we make our contribution to that. And this year they've asked for the contribution. Uh, I, I haven't seen the finished product because they're still compiling it. But it's a six-year window of, ass of, an, of assessment and anticipation. So it reflects the Hampton Academy project that we anticipate. It reflects ongoing budgeting and the operating budget for technology uh, turn of our inventory and the $300,000 long-term maintenance warrant article. Uh, it anticipates that the continued roof work at Marston will be done out of that $300,000 each of the next couple, two or three years until we finish that project. And that anything else that's a priority outside of Hampton Academy's reconstruction project in the next six years can and should be accomplished as a part of the operating budget or the $300,000. So I... Um, you didn't get a lot of time to review it, but you've reviewed it in years past, and it really hasn't changed other than what I've just described. So I simply have tried, uh, as a rule, to bring it to the board for your adoption, if you will, 
before I make it a part of the town's um, uh, program. So, are you looking for a motion? I'd seek a motion to adopt the CIP as presented. I'll make a motion to Move adopt. To Andrea. Thank you. Second. Seconded. Pepper. Any discussion? Are we ready for the question? All those in favor of adopting the CIP as presented? Unanimous. Thank you very much. I'll send it along in the morning. Okay. Did you want to talk Come about on. monthly anything special? So uh, the, the general fund financial report, it's really early in the year. Uh, I had a first blush at uh, salaries and benefits. I'll do my best to review those in the next couple of weeks so that you, in your next report, can anticipate that that's pretty close to done. Um, I can tell you, I made a comment in the notes, there are some significant special education costs that I think you'll see in the next financial or in the one that follows. So I, I can't really put a number on it, but it's going to be, um, it's going to have an impact on the, on the overall budget because um, because it's at that, it'll, they'll be at that level. So, something to take a look at. Uh, I included the food service financial first, first run after the first month of performance. So again, I give you a pretty, pretty. I want, I don't want to call them useless, but I, I give you the current revenues, which there hadn't <laughs> been any posted at that time, and expenditures. So it's hard to draw much from that. But I use those to to put together a projection for the year. And it looks again like we'll be narrowly in the black. Uh, that's certainly the goal, and Mary and I are working towards that. Uh, I gave you the statistical analysis sheets that follow, so that you can take a peek at that. And again, that'll it'll tell you more as we look at it over time. Should be in color, though. It's kind of hard to look. You at. know what? I'm uh, Kathy and I will like, work on that. <laughs> yeah, the color certainly makes a difference. And if I showed you mine, yeah. you'd see the color. What, just one. Wait, wait, wait. We, we had Nathan and I pretty much in the packet because Kathy was out sick. And so there were a few things that we uh, missed. And a couple of hiccups. We won't let Kathy be out sick anymore, I promise. Uh, so Nathan and I had a few. That was one of them, Peppa. Well, thank you. I, I included the Fed Funds report. Uh, I draw your attention to the draft timeline. I brought you a colorful copy tonight. <laughs> Kathy's back. <laughs> um, so here's, I, I, I don't necessarily need a vote, but I, I just want your consensus. Um, when you talk calendar tonight, now or later, we drafted up some ideas, some suggestions. So if you start at the top of this timeline, the intention will be, or our intention internally, is that we'll have a full budget ready to be presented to you, a budget book for your review by the end of the month. So in the last week of October, we'll hand over the books. We thought we would hit the ground running the following week, and so we tentatively scheduled that we could have budget work sessions with the board. And again, these are all, I put five o'clock, that might be too early for folks to start, but the, the first couple of Wednesdays, the second and the ninth. On the ninth, you have a school board meeting here, rescheduled from election night. So we thought maybe we could meet before then. There are first draft is probably not going to be enormous changes in the budget. So my thought was that we might click through this and target really the things that are going to be of biggest interest to you. And then we put a third night, the 14th, if we needed to, to come back and finish it up. So that at Thanksgiving, we would hand the budget books over to the budget committee, as we have each year, and we are scheduled uh, for our regular school board meeting on the 13th when we could take any votes on any money articles or the budget if we hadn't take final hadn't had final votes yet so that we would walk into the budget committee on the first kind of orange line their pink line December 20th that's the night we've been invited to come to the budget committee and present and they asked us to present everything in years past we've broken up we've done budget in December come back in January and done Warren articles mm -hmm. I don't anticipate we'll have any big, I mean, again, it's your budget. I mean, it's your ballot, right? Your warrant. But the, the project and the budget, uh, I'm sure Sacred Heart will be there and the 300000 we can talk about. But there won't, I don't expect there's anything else. We don't have any negotiations and probably no other special warrant articles. So we agreed that we thought we could come to the Budget Committee on the 20th of December, locked and loaded with our entire warrant. That way we don't have to come back in early January. 
until it's time for the budget hearing, which is set for January 12th. And then, of course, the deliberative session is in February and the vote's in March. So action or no action, that was just some proposals. Um, are there any dates that stand out for people? I know it's early, but I did ask folks to bring calendars. I can't be here before 5.30. Okay. So if we change all those 5 o'clock times to 5.30, does that help? That would be, I could be there, otherwise I won't be there for the first. Okay. Does that work is, for you, Frank? Is six, does that work for you, Frank? I'm looking at the dates, so. Frank? He's looking at the dates, yeah. No, I'm, I'm fine with the dates. I can tell you the uh, regular board meeting on the 9th is going to have a very short agenda. <laughs> and, and if so, I'd invite, if we started at 5.30 and you wanted to start the regular at 7 or 7.30, or if you wanted to interrupt the regular, ha interrupt the budget session, have the regular session, sure. and then go right back into budget Absolutely. that evening. Absolutely. Anything that works. I was trying to use that date because I knew you were going to be here anyway, and I anticipated it might be thin. Well, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Reverse it. Have the. Have, Would well, you just like the board said. meeting first, and then? Yeah. I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So we start the board meeting at 530, board meeting. get through yep. that, and then go right to your budget work? Yeah. Okay. Th that way we won't hold up anybody like the principal sure. or anything like that. Yeah. It's a good yeah. point. Uh, so the purple dates, October 26th to December 13th, are good for everybody? <coughs> okay. Well, I think those are the major ones. Yeah, I don't those see are the biggest other ones. things. After that, it's regular stuff. Sure. I did want to give you the dates that the budget committee are the ones that are in pink. Uh -huh. So December 20th, we'll present to the budget committee. Only if they need us to come back will we do 3rd or 5th of January. And then the public hearing will be the 12th. The one thing that I, um, the one thing that I don't have on here, uh, well, I did. I put it over in the notes. Look at January 10th, which is that Tuesday night. We have to have a separate public hearing on the bond, but that doesn't have to be separate from a board meeting. It can be the same evening. It just isn't going to fit the night that the budget committee does the public hearing on the school because they do the town same night. So we thought that maybe following, uh, pre preceding or following the board meeting on the 10th, we could do the bond hearing. That and could again, take we'll, 10 minutes. It could, and we'll figure that out when we get there. Yeah. Yep. And then the budget committee has to do one, right? They they do the, the budget and all the money articles, quote unquote. Yeah. But you have to have a separate, for a multi-year bond, you have to have a separate public hearing. The to satisfy the statute, but they don't, that's your hours. meeting. Your, the bond hearing is yours. Okay. The budget hearing is theirs. Okay. How, how does this look? Any, anything standing out is not doable for anyone? Well, then we'll just adopt this as uh, Great. tentative. Tentative plan. If anybody finds out something uh, is on it, one of those dates, let us know, and we'll miss you. <laughs> No. <laughs> the only other thing that I have, if you if you'd like, I, as a as a part of the facility conversation, we've talked about bonding and about the financial impact. And in your packet, um, the last piece of my report is a single page landscape kind of spreadsheet that spoke to bonding costs. Um, I, I have a brief presentation a little slideshow that we can walk through if it helps I don't know if anybody had a chance to look at that and had any thoughts or questions I simply don't want to keep you is it did it make the package yes oh god I okay yeah we did that one okay wait a minute All right, I want to tell you then it's page uh... we didn't number the page oh, no, page number. <laughs> it's prior to policies right before the policy page. I uh, I looked at, the, uh, at your numbers and uh, uh, I do have a concern with the, you know, average assessment. I, I don't believe the average. I mean, we just went through a reevaluation, and 
and I think that assessment should be probably closer to 425, 450. Uh, the number I got from Ed Tinker, the assessor. So I mean, I it was 330 when we used it last. So 380 was the number that he and I agreed to, but it's really just for illustration. And I think okay, um, I, we could use that. The other thing that I think when we get down the line, I like the notion of saying this is what it costs for every hundred grand or for every fifty grand. Let somebody do the math. You know, I want to make it as easy as I can for people to yeah. implement this. But 380 was without the impact of waterfront property so if you I'm not looking at if you if I added in all the waterfront <laughs> property the average single-family home popped up over 400 went to four I forget now 414 maybe 420 this 380 was single-family dwellings without Water. waterfront included so are you expecting a big flood to take away the water no no no, no it was simply trying to you know <laughs> trying to come up with a fair representation of what's the average well, but, home. I, I, but the reason I bring that up is because last year when we presented. Uh, I, I do know that there was a concern because, you know, people are, are looking at property assessments mm -hmm. and the town was flooded with people arguing their assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. But the assessment value went up almost 15 to 30 percent anywhere. On the low side, it was 50, and that came from the assessor. Oh, yeah. All right. So yep. if you're looking at what did you say, three thirty? Three thirty last time. Okay, and you're looking at a thirty percent increase. Okay, that's almost a hundred thousand dollars in my math. Okay, which would make it from three thirty to four thirty. Okay, and even if you look at the average of twenty percent. All right, that's an additional sixty seventy thousand, which nowhere near the three eight. And those numbers came from their department. Hmm. Well, I think they're all they're hoping when they average it out that it will be right. <coughs> well, uh, we did get an analysis that that was done, um, it, it, you know, and it didn't come from Tinker's office, but and we did. I did get an analysis over the weekend that indicated that they would that given the property evaluation um, that. Um, there, there would be a reduction. So um, they targeted the tax rate at um, a significant decrease from where it is right now. So we, we don't want to say too much more because no, you've got to no, have no. the right numbers. But um, <coughs> given all that's happened, uh, they believe that we'll see a reduction, and which is good news for us as we go forward with this project. And it's really important. What Nate's going to review right now <coughs> is critical to this project. Nothing about the project was about the programs, about the building, about what was being done, right? It wasn't. What was it about? It was about the cost in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, just this week we found out that Stratum, our next door neighbor, is doing a middle school project on a 20-year building, not a 100-year-old building. Well, no, we're not 100. Nin 1939. God, we're not that old 1939? The, the first... Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I thought pictures there that went back to 1812. No, 1939. No, not the actual <laughs> building. The that actual the building. But, but the point is, they're, they're doing a $22.5 million project in Stratum on their middle school on a 20-year building. A building they built in 96. Yeah. It's time right. already. And our building was built in 1939, and we can't get, we've got, and we're asking the for 24.9. The last time we did anything of substance was the sixth grade wing in the seventh. So, so Nathan's analysis that he's done with the help of Ed Tinker is really, really critical. I, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, I don't. I go have, you have the paperwork, so you've had a chance to look at it. I don't want to. I don't want to make you meeting any longer than I have to. You know, I like to talk, so I'll talk quickly. Slow me down if there's anything you want me to say more about. Really. This was a presentation that we did initially to the Hampton Academy Project Advisory Committee, and it's just important for the board to stay up to speed with what the committee's looking at. So, assumptions underlying this. Number one, $25 million, the project. I mean, we're still waiting for them to come back and look at final costs, et cetera, with inflationary pressures in the market, et cetera, but bonding links. It was important in the conversation that we had that people thought we needed to look at longer than just 20 years. So we looked at 20, 25, and 30 year 
the rates that get tucked into that, 2.5% for 20 years, 2.35, 2.75 for 25 years, and 2.86 on the 30 year. Those are some real numbers based upon what the bond bank, the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank, did in their January and June sales. And as long as the Federal Reserve doesn't click up the interest rates that underlie all of this, those are probably pretty good numbers, and we might even come in a little bit better. Although it's hard to imagine it getting much cheaper than that for this kind of borrowing. The valuation has been adjusted to the $3.3 billion tax base that we have in Hampton, according to this what was latest it last valuation, 2.783. Say that again. 2.783 million, not 2.783 billion. So I updated the average home based upon that conversation from 330 to 380. It actually was 378.6 or something like that, but the zeros really helped. Nice round numbers for everybody when we're talking about it. So I rounded up just a bit, just a bit. So the plan, loosely, we're going to vote in March of 2017, and we need funding to begin almost immediately on the architectural and engineering design so we can get this project started, assuming that we have a positive vote. Our phasing plans that you remember from the last cycle called for summer, that first summer for there to be, you know, if we'd had a vote, we'd have already knocked down the sixth grade wing and started building the gym and its place and the classroom wing on the back end, right? So, so we'd look at the bond sale in June of 2017. First payment will be due in February, which is only interest. It's a six month, it's only half the year, so it's only interest, which means you don't have the full tax impact yet. And that would be a part of the 1718 budget. Okay, we're building a 1718 budget now. First full payment will be due in 18, of August of 18, that's part of the 1819 budget. So the first month, the first interest payment, that's what we have to write into that Warren article. And raise and appropriate, da 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 da. We have to put that in the article so that it's part of that first year's budget. Okay, so here was the comparison that we did. Starting with 20 years, and this is in your sheet, but here's another presentation or representation of it. The impact, the new money, would be essentially 11 cents a thousand, which on your $380,000 home would cost you $41.80 of new tax dollars. It's not your whole tax bill. Your tax bill is a lot bigger than that, right? But this would be new cost to you for that year, that cycle. That next year, we would have in the budget the first full payment, which would cost you another new 37 cents. Remember last time around we were talking about the Marston bond and the Central School bond and the offsets and the savings? I'm not talking about any of that right now. I'm not playing games with any of that because it just even. So that's not people. included. That's in not this. included. Okay. There's no benefit there. Okay. This is just all new cost. How we offset that or find that money is different, right? But so another new 37 cents a thousand, which costs that average homeowner $140. Which means that at that point you have now taken a bite of 48 cents per thousand of new money, new cost, which is $182 a year. Why is that more than 160 last year? Because the 160 was taking into account savings from the retiring bonds. I'm not taking into that, I'm not taking that into account now. So on a 20 year bond, you eat 41 bucks year one, 42, and then another 140 of new cost. And from that point for the rest of 20 years, you're paying an extra $182 a year. To or $15 afford a month. Over 20 years. Right, right, over 20 years. Now, what if it's 25 years? Because there's been a lot of folks that have, have made the suggestion that longer duration is better, especially for those on fixed incomes who might not still be living here, have may have moved to another alternative or housing or out of state or what have you, right? What's their impact gonna be? Letting somebody who's not in town now come to town with their kids and pay to take advantage of this new facility themselves. Many, many arguments. So we ran for 25 years. Instead of 11 cents, it's 12 cents a thousand that first bite. Why? Because 25 years, there's more interest, and so our first interest only payment is higher. $45.60. Because you're spreading it out over 25 years, your, your first, first full year is only 30 cents. Your total impact is not 48 cents anymore, now it's just 42 cents a year, and you're paying out roughly $160 a year for 25 years. 
No, no, that, takes in, that takes into assumption that we don't have a Fed increase. This this assumes that we go to market June of 17 and the Fed Reserve has not bumped at a quarter of a percent. Okay. Or, or whatever they might. But all indication is they will bump probably in December. All, it's, I follow this yeah, very I closely. Do too, okay. and, yeah. and, and uh, we thought that was going to happen last December, as you recall, and correct. it never happened. So You're we are correct. keeping our fingers crossed that she keeps it level. What would be, and again, and oil prices I just, are going to do that. Okay. Let me finish 30 years. Hold on to your. So 30 years, by comparison, is 13 cents in the first year for $49.40, 25 cents the next year. Your total impact each year, thirty-eight cents, hundred and forty-four dollars. So, obviously, if you look at that, the longer the duration of the bond, the the slightly higher the impact in the interest-only year, the first year in, but the lower the tax impact every year thereafter. But you got to pay for it somehow, right? <laughs> Just want you to know, over the life of that twenty, twenty-five, or thirty-year bond. The average homeowner, that three hundred eighty thousand dollar homeowner, is paying out thirty seven hundred, or four thousand, or almost forty four hundred dollars, over those twenty, twenty five, or thirty years, and the entire bond for the community costs you seven million in interest, or ten million in interest, or twelve point six million in interest. The longer the term of the bond, the higher the interest cost. 30 years cost you five and a half percent, excuse me, five and a half million dollars more, which is 77 percent more. That matters to some people who look at it in the big picture and say, that's not prudent, that's a waste of five and a half million dollars. But for a lot of voters who don't anticipate paying after the first 10 years, they just assume pay less and have another 15 be added on the back end, right? The longer the bonding term, the more cost overall. The average homeowner is going to pay 700 bucks more over 30 years than they would have over just 20 years because we paid more in interest. But those higher costs did save you. You can see that I spun it with the facilities committee. I was spinning it a little different. I was trying to be prudent. I was trying to argue for 20 years. It only saves us 12 cents a thousand. That the difference in between 20 and 30 years is between 48 and 38 cents which is about 40 bucks a year saved from the average homeowner. So do you spend an extra five and a half million when it really only saves you about 40 bucks a year to the average taxpayer? I have to tell you that over the course of the last month and a half of this, kind of, this conversation with the Facilities Committee, I've kind of come to the middle ground, which is I would recommend a 25 year bond. It seems that it doesn't spend five and a half million, it only, it only adds a couple of million to our interest, but it does flatten some of the impact on the taxpayers, which I think will appease some of your voters. So that's essentially, let me go back here, because I think that's what this So one of our goals is to try to bring you pieces of information because it's so complex every board meeting. Um, next, uh, in November, your facilities committee would like to come before you with a recommendation. So this helps you to understand where they're coming from. We will continue to, through to March at bringing you pieces of information and using this forum to keep everyone educated. Uh, I, I think it would be prudent if you show the numbers if the bond had passed last year versus this year because obviously the costs have increased. So the more you procrastinate, the more you kick the can down the road, it's going to cost the taxpayers much more money. And I, I think, you know, in, in a prudent fashion, that's going to wake up some people to say, listen, you know, I may have not have gone with it last year, but if I don't go with it this year, you know, it's going to cost us much more. You know, I, I think if they see the numbers, it's a selling point for us. Hey, if you don't agree with that, that's fine. Well, we, you know, that's a we great agree. point because at one of our meetings, we'll share that with you. We will show you the differential between what what it was last year and what it is this year. It's a great point. Part of what I want to make sure I empower you with is, at some point, we're going to say to the board, and the ballot should say what? What is it you're going to put forward? And part parcel of, yes, put the project forward is 20, 25, 30. 
how do you want to pay for this, how do you want to finance this, because it all impacts what goes on the ballot and what we propose and, and present to the community moving forward. So this, just to, you know, I know that was quick, but if you have any questions, you, like the community listening at home, don't hesitate to come in or call or send an email, and we can definitely talk to you. Any other questions about that? And while we're talking about this project, there is going to be an open house, and I forgot the date, October 25th. October 25th. And the time? 7, 6 o'clock the course, and 7 o'clock the open session, information session with an opportunity for community people to ask questions. So, you know, it, it could be another good night. We have a press release ready to go. And we can get that on Channel 13. Channel 13, Channel 22, Twitter, Facebook. We'll do the rounds. A lot. Yeah. Have we, uh, have we run into any stone walls on this program? Well, I want to I want to say one other thing, if I could. I want to commend you on an excellent presentation to the budget committee. I understand that we had one individual that, you know, really uh, put a lot of questions towards you, and, and you basically filled them out completely. Am I, am I right on that? You are right. Yes. 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 And, and they were wise to give us cautions as far as sidewalks. And, you know, we knew that going in when we were discussing sidewalks that we didn't own it. And, and people, some people were passionate about it. Their passion got a little hold of them. And Kathleen and Nate, they did very well. And um, we moved on. And I think it's going to be an interesting budget season. But it is wise when we work with the selectmen and they work with us that we do realize whose territory is what and to work together for the common good. And that's what we're going to do. So. That's the safety of the children. I mean, that's yeah. what and, and that's And I really wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, yeah. it's just a passion got a hold of a man that happens. And as long as you can walk away from the table, said we agree to disagree and move on, you're still off for all that. And that's what we do. Anything else on the budget committee? No, that was about all that was exciting. <laughs> We're ready for about four more weeks. Mary Louise is now the chairman of the budget committee, so she'll be probably getting a hold of you. Oh, she's already been in contact with us on numerous <laughs> occasions and helped with the dates and all that. See, okay. I think I think we talked about. Yep. Thank you. I have nothing from the school board's association. Department. Well, we already said that. Yeah, oh, yeah. we. Yeah. So, uh, I wish I had something to share, but okay. no communication. And curriculum. Yeah, we already talked about that. Okay. Professional development. No. The only yeah, thing we're yeah. going to do with Tupper, uh, Tupper with professional development at our next meeting is we'll begin the process of rewriting our plan. It's due. It's uh, expiring June of 17, so we have to have a new plan presented to the Department of Ed by. So we're going to work on that. Sure. Work on it. Yeah. So I'm going to need your help. I'll, I'll talk yep. to you. Okay. Okay. So we've got some policies to look at. So some of these are, we're deciding whether we're going to keep them. My only concern is that it has not been done. Right. And so <laughs> it's sort of like a policy that in the big, huge thousand policy book. <laughs> I mean, it's never a bad idea, but for some reason we just haven't ever had the opportunity. So I would, it would be my recommendation to eliminate this policy. Second. Was that a motion? Second. Oh, sorry. Any I make a motion. Sorry, I thought, and I said I knew what she was doing. So sorry. <laughs> okay. All in favor of eliminating this policy? Okay. I think on the back, same type of thing. Yep. Moved, Andrea. So this is an appendix to the first one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Moved, okay. yeah. Andrea. So I yeah. Second. Peppa. Peppa. <laughs> Any discussion? 
All those in favor? Done. Okay, we are at regular board meetings. I think there were some changes in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, some housekeeping changes by the looks of it. Yeah, the only, Andrew, do you want me to? No, but yeah, go ahead. The only change in this would be in the first paragraph, and because it, it says beginning at 7 p.m. and ending no later than 11 p.m., and obviously that's not what we do, so we just eliminated it. And you okay. have some flexibility to change up the times like you did for this summer versus the winter when you need a little more time. So that's the only change. Okay. So I would make a motion to accept the policy with the eliminating the, the specific time. time. Second. Frank? Okay. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. This that brings all us to them. BEA. Uh, once again, this has got some times. No, this is the same, same one. Oh, that's the same, same one. one. I'm sorry. Struck, what we try to do is give you what out. was oh, there and what we took okay. away so you know okay. what so we don't doing. have to yeah. do that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say it looked identical. Yeah, it is. It's just so we can show you what was there and then what we what we're proposing. Okay. BGC, which is policy review manual accuracy check. Andrew, did I would make a motion to accept this policy with the revision of taking out that sentence that says the board directs the superintendent to recall all policy and regulation manuals annually because it was not being done. Right. Done and it's on the website. Right. Second, Frank, discussion? All those in favor? Five zero zero. Uh, new board member orientation. I, I again make a motion to accept this as rewritten um, and that new members will have access online as will former, you know, current members, access online, provided pr printed materials upon request, um, school board policy manual, I guess, I guess we don't, like <coughs> I said, we don't really need it unless requested, and that we add, this was added, a school board member should take advantage of the new member training sponsored by New Hampshire School Board Association. I went to that. Okay. So that was a motion I just made. Motion. Second. Frank, discussion? All those in favor? Five zero zero. Okay. Uh, administrative changes, we're just going to delete this. Make a motion to delete this policy. Second. All those in favor? Approval of the handbooks. We're reviewing this. Yes. this yeah, this one's for review, right? Because we didn't. Right, we questioned whether that was that necessary. Do, do we want, yeah, do we want the board to have to approve and adopt all handbooks prior to publication and distribution? Speaking I, of. I don't. <laughs> Speaking as a principal, I don't know how you can really do that because right. you've got to get yeah. things out to kids and parents and whatever. Yeah. So right. I, I'd opt out of this. I, I mean, we haven't. Have we ever? Well, we have. Yes. You yes. have yes. been yes. doing yes. the well, typos. When, when, and when, <laughs> when did we do that? We, 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 we kind of have the last few years. We do it in August, which is really tough Too because exactly. then we're trying right. to get it done, make any changes we right. need, and get it out to the printer yeah. and back in so that we yeah. can hand it out to parents on the first day of school. I'd make the motion to delete this one. Okay. Second. Second. Frank. <laughs> That's gone. If you ever have a parent who calls and has a concern about the handbook, then you can bring it up at a meeting. Oh, you yeah. can say, hey, this is policy. Sure. Does it make sense in your, or this information, does it make sense? You you can do that. Don't. We don't need a policy to go to ahead and do something it, yeah. like that. All those in right. favor? Right. Five zero zero. Uh, 
this next one, I'd make a motion to delete this policy um, because this checklist, um, it, it's anything that's in this checklist is already covered under other safety plans and it doesn't need, it's almost like this is redundant and doesn't done. need to be done because it's already covered. Second. Frank. All those in favor? Five zero zero. So this is a, a copy of that too, right? Yeah. Yes. Is there a copy of it? Uh, yeah. There's two. There's two here. So on the, on the defib one. Okay. Oh, remember that one, Andrea? Yeah. We just removed. We removed the part about the school nurse and his or her designation should report all instances of AED use to the New Hampshire Department of Safety um, on the forms. Um, that is not something that is currently done yeah. and is not going to be done. So okay. we need to accept the new one without that, without number five in it. Moved. Uh, well, I'll make that motion. Seconded. Okay. Pepper. Okay. This is a second read too. Is this a second read? Um, uh, uh, no, this yes, is a second. First read to First me. read. Okay. Okay. Does it matter? So we don't really have to. We e don't have to vote on it. First read. Even though it's even though it's a first read, I still make the motion that we okay. accept it as as corrected. Mm -hmm. You want to see it again? Yes. You'll see it yes. again next week just for a final. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. Next month. Rather. All those five zero zero. But oh, we're going to see it again. Yeah. Because that is new language, new changes. And the, the, fa the final one is concussions and head in injuries. So this and that's one, a, we worked with the school nurses and all of the, you know, all the, it, it's much, it's tight. It re They really tightened up. Um, the um, policy it very much is in conjunction with what happens at Winnicunnant. Um, I, I think there was a lot of specific stuff that didn't need to be in there that's right. already covered um, in, in through other venues and other avenues. So I would move to accept the policy as corrected. Um, revised. I'm sorry, as revised. Second, Frank. All those in favor? Aye. Was this this was also a first read? Am uh, I correct? Right. Oh, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we so have we'll to bring this we'll one back. We'll yeah. see yeah. that again, but it is a revision, but it's also a first read on, it, and it's quite a bit. So we'll bring it back. Okay. Okay. And that brings us to minutes of September thirteenth. Folks want me to go page by page, or they just want you just want to uh, accept them as presented, or make any changes. Motion to accept them. Page yeah. page three. This just a at very top in social studies. There will be local control. I don't know if you want to get that picky to put that T to a lowercase. Anything else? No, not that's it. Okay. Move to accept those minutes of September 13th. I'll make Public. Andrea, okay. for a second. Yeah. All those in favor? Is everybody here? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Non-public? We did. We, did we have a non-public? No, no. No. Okay. Correspondence. I've passed out to folks some correspondence that I got. Do we have anything to sign? Manifest? I just want to say thank you. You folks have been very accommodating of the manifest schedule and very responsive. Thank you very much. I was wondering if anybody needed to go. Did we have any uh, business that we wanted to take care of or discuss in non public? I think so too. Go into non-public. Okay. Now. Under 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 RSA. It should be on your agenda, uh, right? Ninety-one yep. dash A colon three 
trouble mm. to <laughs> parentheses A. A. <laughs> Roll call, Peppa. Yes. Aye. 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 Yes. Yes. Okay. Joni, thank you. Thank you.